my juicy co-creators, Lilu here on the Juicy Living Tour today in beautiful, uh, is this part of Los Angeles? We're originally in Beverly Hills, This right? This is Beverly Hills, yes. right. So Larry, I'm excited to interview you. I had some of the co-creators here, uh, actually Craig Granville that said you got to interview Larry. I mean, he had this amazing connection with Elvis Presley, the king, yeah, yeah. as he known. Yeah. And you, I, I really look forward to discussing, I mean, your own journey and how, what, what is for you this, this um, how do you see life and what are some of the conversations, of course, that you had with Elvis Presley because you spend quite a lot of time. I'm, I'm interested to know how you you met him because you were his personal hairdresser sure. his friend his confident but also his spiritual mentor so Elvis was spiritual hang on I haven't heard that before this was the basis of his life that's why he is who he is because he was a spiritual being and he was aware of it and he was aware of spiritual evolution I started my career in 1960 and we opened the very first salon for men in America. Men would go to barber shops, traditional barber shops. We opened a salon and we shampooed the hair first, we blew dry the hair, and we would style hair according to your bone structure, your look, your eyes. And right off the bat, our clientele read like a Hollywood's who's who. Frank Sinatra, Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Rog Hudson, Peter Sellers, Roy Orbison, all the great stars in motion pictures, television recording. But in 1964, I got a phone call to please come to Elvis's house in Bel Air. And I went. And I walked in, and I walked up to Elvis. We shook hands, and I'm looking at this face. Because his beautiful face. He was a living masterpiece. Mm. He said, Come on, man, let's go into my bathroom. You'll fix my hair, we'll talk. So we go into the bathroom. He put his head in a basin, and I quickly put the shampoo. I started to rinse it out. I'm cupping it with my hand. In the salon, we have bowls, we have people doing that for us so here I am trying to do this quickly and gently and all of a sudden Elvis picks his head up and he starts rearing it and the water is splattering everywhere it's hitting me he's drenched now and he looks at me with that million dollar Elvis smile and he says what the hell at least it's clean <laughs> but when he said that it put me at ease because that's the moment I knew who he was. Mm -hmm. We connected. Mm -hmm. He was real. He didn't have ego filters. Mm -hmm. He didn't want you to know he was Elvis. But he was a regular, if I was a president of the United States mm -hmm. or I was working in the garage in his car, it wouldn't matter. He was for real. We sit down, I do his hair, and after about 45 minutes, I sprayed it. I said, so what do you think, Elvis? And he said, beautiful, beautiful, but wait a minute, who are you? And he points at me, just like I'm pointing at you. Who are you, Larry? What are you really all about? What are you into? This is the first conversation, really, that we had. And I thought to myself, my God, he's being so forthcoming here, so forward. And I said, well, Elvis, you know I work with celebrities. I do hair. That's what I do for a living. But you wanted to know something else about you. He wanted to, because he, he, he heard something from someone. I said, Elvis, to answer your question, ever since I could remember, I'm looking for the truth, for the purpose of life. Why are we here? Do we have, really have souls? Is there life after death? Is there really a purpose for living? I read spiritual books. I'm a vegetarian, I meditate, I pray. I said, look, look, Elvis. You were I, there already in your 20s? I was 24 years old, Elvis was 28 at the time. And remember, this is 1964. This is be right before the explosion and, and the cultural revolution of the 60s, where all these things started to emerge. This is prior, we're at the cusp right now. I said, look, I know you're the biggest star in the world. This probably sounds corny to you. He said, whoa, whoa, Larry, wait, man. You have no idea 
how I need to hear what you have to say. Please, keep on talking. Tell me more. Tell me more. He had this curiosity, huh? He had this thirst for knowledge or... Here's what blows Connection, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Lilo, this is what blows my mind. When most people in life start to question life itself, when they start to dig deeper and f try to find questions, it usually is spawned from a tragedy, mm -hmm. an illness, mm -hmm. loss of a relationship, a job, some kind of tragedy. Elvis was the greatest star in the world. Wealthy, more fans than any celebrity that ever lived, and that's even true today. The greatest voice, he had everything life could possibly offer anyone. Maybe there was still an insecurity in him? But he saw the vacuousness, the banality of fame and fortune. He knew that was not the answer to life. Mm -hmm. He got it quickly. When he came on the scene, he exploded. So he had everything. He tasted fame and fortune. And he knew that that was not the answer. There was still this depth, this hole, this yearning for something more. He knew and he said to me, did you find the purpose? Did you find out anything? And I said, well, I did. Here's what I found out, Elvis. I found out that my purpose is to spend my life, my time, and my energy to discover what my purpose really is. That's my initial purpose. That's what I'm doing now. He said, right, right, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Well, we got into a conversation that lasted about three hours. And, and I'll never forget, Elvis said to me, he said, you know those uh, miniature ships they put in, in, in a in glass bottles. I always thought that was man. That was the human being. That we're locked within this. And when he said that to me, I knew what he was really saying. That's where he was. And he felt trapped in this... Uh, in, glass bubble. In a bubble. Mm -hmm. And I said, Elvis, there's so much more to life than what a lot of people think. It's not just a bunch of molecules that one day started to evolve and create this universe. And I said, I could never buy that either. He said, I was raised in the church, he said. He said, I always believed there was a God. He said, and he said to me, and I could see, as we're talking, in my mind's eye, I can see him. He went like this, why? Why was I plucked out of all the millions and millions of lives? to be Elvis Presley. Why? He said, Larry, did you, did you know I, I had a, a twin brother that died at birth? And I said, yeah, Elvis, I heard about that. I know all about your, we all know about your life. He said, why me? It's a heavy to carry in a lifetime, yeah. Oh my gosh. I have twin sisters, Lilo, and I know the things that they go through. And it must be so interesting just to have a, a twin that looks like you. And he said, but why did I survive? Why me? Why didn't Jesse Guerin live? He said, did I do something in the womb? Did I kick him? Did I do something to get out first? Or did I? Well, actually, Jesse came first, but, and he was stillborn. Elvis said, I have so many questions. He said, the things that you're talking about, Larry, This is what I secretly think about, especially late at night when I go to bed. But I don't have anyone to talk to about this. I said, well, Elvis, I looked at my watch because I was about three hours in this conversation. I said, I've got to get back to the salon. Peter Sellers is waiting for me. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, I got a, I got a great idea. Go back and tell him you quit and you work for me full time. What do you think? Right there, off of the first conversation. That was it. And when he said that, there was no doubt. I mean, when something is right, you, you know it, you feel it. You know, you know when, like when you meet someone, you don't have to start questioning, who is this person? Do I like to, is this happening? If it's there, it's happening. You, the energy's there. You go with it. You want to bond with it. You want to be close to it. It's part of you. Mm. You merge. Mm. And that's what happened. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, yes. He said, you just meet me tomorrow. You go to Paramount Studios tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock and bring me some of those books you talked about. Which books did you bring now? Well, the, I, brought, time. I brought three books that first time. And let me just preface by saying that over the years, we amassed a library to match none. I mean, it was, Elvis had a portable library of 200 books wherever he went, his aides, his entourage would carry. At any rate, the next morning, I got to Paramount Studios, and what happened was I went back and I quit, and I was so excited, I ran into the salon, and I fell, and I fractured my arm. And that night, someone said to me, you must go to the hospital. My arm swelled up three times its size. I said, if I go to the hospital, they're going to put a cast on me. And if they do that, I'll never be able to do Elvis's hair in the morning. I'm going to brave it. I'm going to sit down. I'm, I'm going to heal myself. I'm going to pray. I'm going to meditate. And somehow God is going to heal me. You didn't I'm see that as a sign that was saying, don't go there. It was a sign saying that Whenever something magnificent happens, there's always obstacles, speed bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. Now you have something to overcome. You overcome it, it's going to even be greater than you think. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, interpret that as, oh, maybe that's not the way I should go then. Some people do. Mm -hmm. but you see that as exactly what is needed to I attain. I saw that an opportunity, yes. Elvis was asking me, when, when Elvis said to me, Would, will you do this? Will you quit your job to do my hair and travel and live with me? What he was saying, in effect, was two things. If you accept, you're going to become responsible for the image of the biggest star on the planet. And his hair is quite something. And that is something to do. But he was asking me something more significant to me, something more profound. That is, you are going to bring me books, you're going to talk to me, you're going to introduce me to the world that you've been telling me these past several hours, and you're going to become responsible to mentor me and to guide me. That's a responsibility that goes beyond, outside of raising a child, nothing is more important than something of that sort. So I stayed up all night and I would heal myself, and I would do affirmations, and whatever I could conjure in my mind. Well, how did you had already all that information or knowledge or knowing, because uh, you were quite young, so what is your, just a little brief maybe, uh, can we yeah. look at your past? Sure. I grew up in, uh, well I was born in New York, and we came out to California when I was seven, and When I was 12, 13 years old, my grandmother was murdered and they found her body in the ocean. This was uh, an upheaval in my family. My mother didn't know where to turn. Fortunately, she met a lady who introduced her to metaphysics, spiritual teaching, science of the mind, inner healing. And I was 13 years old, and I have twin sisters that are seven years younger. My dad would go to work every day, and my mother had no one to really talk to at home but me. So every day she would read to me from her books. She was really reading to herself, but I was there as a sounding board and was very helpful to her. But because she did that for me, it allowed me a few years later to think for myself mm -hmm. and to initiate my own quest because I have my own questions. And I'll never forget my mother reading to me something that has stayed with me all these years. Change your thinking, change your life. Mm -hmm. And I know Wayne Dyer speaks about this in his book. And I say today, change your thinking, change your life, but do it, mm -hmm. act upon it. Mm -hmm. So this allowed me, when I was 19, 20 years old, to start reading books. And I read everything I get my hands on, from Paramahansa Yogananda to Krishnamurti to Gurdjieff to all the Eastern teachings, all the Western teachings. So the first three books I brought to Elvis was a little book that became his favorite book. It's called The Impersonal Life. 
and another book called Autobiography of a Yogi, and another book called 14 Lessons in Yogi Philosophy. And then I brought the Prophet and other books. Khalil Gibran, yeah. Exactly. And Elvis devoured them, and he knew, knew the Prophet by heart. I'll never forget one day we're in Las Vegas, many years later, and all of Elvis's people were sitting there, and Elvis uh, had the book in his hand, and he gave it to someone. He said, open the book to any page. And the person opened it and started to read and stopped and said, Elvis, I don't know what this means. Elvis recited the rest of the page by memory and explained it to the person. That's definitely not something we hear every day or I had heard of before. Yeah, that's that's really, it's not just uh, here and there. It was really starting to, he, he would dig in there. He would get deepened by it. Yes. So how, how then, why the why the drugs or why all this then? Where did it... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, it's a contradiction. We're talking about someone who had more fans than anyone in the world. And Elvis loves his fans so much. He always loved his fans. He, he would say so many times in so many different ways, it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be in the position I am in today. I owe them everything. And his lifestyle was always on the go, fast track. And when Elvis was in the army in 1958, his career came to a halt and he went to Germany. And he was on the tank corps in the dead of winter when it dipped down to below zero. And Elvis was afraid that he would fall asleep. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, here, he gave him pills to stay up. And that's how Elvis got into pills. And he took pills to stay up, and he had needed them to go back to sleep again. And that's how he got involved. And over the years, he got into that pill syndrome, and he became addicted to them. Were you trying to talk him out of it? Without a doubt. Several people in Elvis's group would talk to him about it. I gave him books on the subject. And what's really interesting is this. In the very last year of Elvis's life, he no? 1977, he woke up to a lot of his blind spots. And we had many, many conversations along these lines. And he said to me, Larry, he said, my life is on the line. My life is on the line. I've got to get off these pills. I've got to change everything. I have to change my whole life. I don't want to tour anymore. I don't want to work for a while. I'm going to, we're going to stop for a year. We're going to go to Hawaii. And we had a house picked out. And he was going to let go of a lot of people that worked for him. And he was going to just keep a handful of people. And he said, I'm going to get on your diet. And I brought him many books on diet, nutrition. And that's what I'm all about now. And I always have been. And my hair care system is coming out called Larry Geller Organics. It's all based in nutrition and exercise. At any rate, Elvis was going to stop touring. He said, and then I'm going to come back to Hollywood. And I want to be the actor that I know that I am. He said, if there's one regret that I have in my life, is that I hadn't become the actor mm. that I know that, I, that I'm capable of. That's my potential. That's what I always, even when I was a kid, he said, I, I'm always going to be a singer. Singing is my life's blood. He said, but you know what? When I was in high school, mm -hmm. I don't know how, the, how I passed and got through it because I used to daydream all the time. Yeah. I used to do visualization. Yeah. And I used to visualize myself on the screen, mm -hmm. on the big screen. And I saw myself there, which is interesting because Elvis was doing that And there's me like intuitively, intuitively. You know that that famous book that sold millions of copies, The Secret. Mm -hmm. It's all about visualizing yourself and what you want to be and become. Elvis did that intuitively, and he said, "That's what I always wanted to be was an actor, and I can do it, man. I can do it. I know it. So we're going to stop touring. 
We're going to Hawaii. I'm going to exercise every day. Why Hawaii? He loved Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii. Which island? Uh, Oahu. And he, we had this house picked out because we were there in March of 1977 for about 10 days. And El we were there many times. We made uh, several movies there. Oh, you like the diamond head uh, Well, area. Well, we stayed in the hotel in Diamond Head, but we rented a house on the other side of the island, secluded, mm. secure for Elvis. And... That's the house that we were going to go to and stay for a year. And he said, I'm going to run on the beach. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to eat correctly. And I'm getting off these pills. I got to stop and I know it. I don't want that in my life. I don't want doctors around me anymore. I want to recharge my batteries. I have so much, so much ahead of me. I want to start a charity. I want to start producing movies. And I want to be an actor. So he had a vision of his future. And we discussed it many times between us, with his father, with one or two other. But most of the people around him didn't know. And He had warnings, like health warnings, that, that he couldn't continue any longer? He had many health warnings. And that's why he knew. That's why he said, my life is on the line. His, every night after a performance... Elvis's blood pressure would shoot up to 180 degrees. His heart would just palpitate. I mean, Elvis died of a massive heart attack. And interesting, a couple hours beforehand, I gave, I gave him a book to read. And he died reading this book. It was it clutched his chest. What was that book? It's called The Scientific Search for the face of Jesus about the Holy Shroud of Turin. Um, so, yes, he did have warnings. And he didn't want to live the lifestyle that he had. He wanted new management. He only wanted to have a few people around him. And he wanted to be an actor. And he wanted to do other things. So... I, this is very important for me to mention because it's not like Elvis uh, just blew up and became heavy and was taking drugs. Yes, that's true, but we have to see it in context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and even more so in the spiritual context or in his view of seeing life through speaking with you and through reading. You're saying this library was huge, so it's like how did how did you get to the point of 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 yeah? I guess you're 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 addicted. I mean, there's this addiction well, there. There's an addiction there, and he also has his fans. Yeah and his l deep love of singing. He loved to sing to people. Mm. So he kept touring and touring and touring, and it became, in a sense, a vicious cycle. Go on tour for a couple of weeks, wear himself out, go back, and, you know, when I speak about Elvis, excuse me, he was the most giving, wonderful, sensitive, beautiful human being. If you met Elvis, he would not only sit and talk to you for a long period of time, <laughs> turn you on and give you a book, he'd buy you a gift, he'd buy you a car, he'd give you a ring or a watch or a necklace. He would just want to do. All Elvis wanted to do is love people. Yeah. He said, I, was, I know what my purpose is. Years later, he discovered his purpose. He said, How would you name it? Yeah, because he was singing, but he was really sharing something. Huh? He was sharing his... He said, I'm here to make people happy. Mm. That's all he wanted to do. Mm. He said, one day, we're on tour, and we're backstage in the dressing room, and we're in Oklahoma City, and I'm doing Elvis's hair, and someone ran in, one of the guys, said, Elvis, I got some great news. Elvis said, what? He said, they're raising the, the price of your tickets. And Elvis looked at him and he said, no, they're not. No way. My fans work so hard just to save up to come to see me perform. He said, no one knows better than me how hard it is out there. He said, I know. That first night with Elvis, he said to me, Larry, he said, do you have any idea where I came from? He says, I know what pain and poverty and suffering is all about more than most people. 
He said, I was born in a shack, a two-room shack that my daddy built with his own hands. We didn't have electricity in our house. We didn't have light bulbs. You never forgot that. How can you forget something like that? Well, some people push that aside. Huh? Not when you grow up like that. Mm -hmm. He said, we didn't have telephones. He said, Larry, we didn't have faucets. We didn't have running water. We had to go outside to a well. We had to go to the bathroom. We had to go outside to an outhouse. No one knows better than me how hard it is out there. I'm not going to allow my fans to pay a lot of money. They can't afford it. Mm. I'm here to help people and to love people. Mm. That's what I'm. That's my mother's middle name. He would say, Gladys Love Presley. Love. And you know. Elvis, the real man, is very different than that image yeah. and the jumpsuit and the lights and the excitement. Yes, he was that, but he was so much more than that. One afternoon, we're talking about his career, what people think of him. And he says to me, you know, people, they call me the king. Like I invented rock and roll. He said, no, no, no. Let me tell you where, how it really started way, way back in the deep south, in the Mississippi Delta, with slaves, slaves that had to work from the sun coming up to the sun going down, in the fields, sweating, backing, breaking their backs, picking cotton. And you know what they did? You know how they got through it? They'd sing. They'd sing to God from their suffering. Mm. They would make up songs as they went along. Mm. And they went into their churches. And we get a lot of their songs today because of their suffering and their pain. And then it got into the white churches. And then that music spread. And it went down to New Orleans. Into the, and that's how the blues started. It went up to Chicago, St. Louis, and it evolved. It evolved into our time, into what they call rhythm and blues. And you know what? I was just lucky enough to be in the right place, in the right time, and introduce their music to a white audience. How did you feel giving him advice, or how did that work? I guess he was really open to it then, but what was the nature? Like he was asking questions, or how would that come about? Or was it when he was encountering a challenge, he would ask you, or? Lilo, we were very close friends, and I was so, f I, I'm not gonna say fortunate, I'm gonna say blessed, because I spent more quality time with Elvis every day. One day I said to him, you know, it's kind of like an excuse I do your hair because what we're really doing is we're taught, this is life. We're both learning. We're both learning. And we would talk every day for hours at a time, hours for years. So it was a conversation. Oh, total conversation, completely. There was no arrogance at all coming from him on None. knowing. Well, Elvis was not an arrogant person. He was no, so down to earth, just like you, just like me. You would have loved him so much, not just because of his physical beauty. And you know, I've been with the greatest looking movie stars in history. I mean, Paul Newman's face and Rock Hudson and these people. Elvis eclipsed them all. He had an extra... He was amazing. Je ne sais quoi. This guy was amazing. He was something else. His eyes? His eyes. What did you see in his eyes? Well, Elvis, wherever he was at within himself, I saw it. He communicated through his eyes. You knew where he was. If he was pissed off, you would see it. You would feel it. I mean, this guy was just, he had an energy field. When you walk in the room, you would feel kinetic energy. Now, he was a force of nature. He was a force. He was a blessing from God to all of us. Mm. More people today have gotten turned on to books and reading and starting their own spiritual quest because of Elvis. I mean, it's a, that, that's, a, that's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yes. Yes. And I say to people all the time, you really want to know what Elvis was like? 
I mean, I can sit and tell you stories and stories and stories and give you my insights. Listen to his music. And if you're in a bad mood, listen to some of his songs or love songs or gospel songs or rock and roll. It will change your whole consciousness. It will penetrate because his voice penetrated to the very core of humanity. Look, what are, who are we talking about? We're talking about someone who has sold more records and albums yeah. than anyone or group who ever recorded. They say 2.5 billion. What? More books written about him than any other entertainer. What's the title of your book about him? My book is called The Leaves of Elvis's Garden. And you can go to uh, ElvisPresleyBiography.net. Yeah. And it's there. Yeah. That's the book you wrote. Yes. You and wrote some other books. I've written two books. And I have a DVD out. And about, I've been in documentaries. And yes. Um, I saw this this video of Elvis and you were in there uh, or and people surrounding him and around him and I guess a lot of people Oh that's on elvisandlarry.com. That's a DVD that I filmed at Elvis's house two years ago. Mm. And it's really good. I like it. Everyone seems to like it. Yeah, but we, we we see the or maybe it's not that one because we see, we hear the, the, the Memphis Mafia. Oh you're oh you're talking about the last twenty four hours yeah. of Elvis. Because I guess when to that level of celebrity, I mean, you must have been uh, disappointed, though, or shocked, or kind of uh, whatever happened after his death, and the people that started sticking around or wanting to get credit for, or what have you. You know, there must have been some things there that must have broken nearly your heart, knowing him that deeply and well. Lilo, <laughs> uh, yes, Elvis died. I almost become speechless. His father said, Larry, you got to go to the funeral parlor right away. You've got to prepare Elvis's hair for the funeral. So the next morning at 8 o'clock, it was all arranged. Tens of thousands of people were outside. They were all silent but crying, hanging on the gates. And I'm looking at them in the distance, and it was just the most extraordinary sight. And I walk into a building, and I walk up to Elvis's body, who's lying on the table with a sheet up to his neck. And I walked up to him, and I, I, I look at that face. I, I, I was stunned. It felt like, like I was ruptured inside, my heart, my soul. I couldn't move. And all of a sudden, cascading down were remembrances of that first time when I met Elvis, you know, at his house. And I stood there and I remembered something. I don't know why I remembered this. But in 1966, I walked upstairs to Elvis's bedroom because every afternoon I would do this at Graceland to do his hair and we would talk and what have you. And I walked into his room and you know when you know someone, you know their body language, you know where they're at. You, could, you know, and I could tell right away something's wrong. I saw that look in his eyes, you know, and I said, what's wrong, Elvis? He said, what's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. And he hands me a movie magazine And it said, Elvis still in deep grief over his mother's death. With a picture of Elvis from one of the movies. And he has tears in his eyes, you know. And he said, man, I can't believe they do this. That was eight years ago. Read, Larry, read, read this. Read it out loud. And it went something like this, Lilo. Elvis's friends... And some family members are very worried because Elvis is in deep grief that his mother died back in 1958. 
and they hear him in the wee hours of the morning pacing back and forth crying and crying and his mood has changed and some people are getting very worried they might want to join and Elvis said to me put it down Larry he said look look no one really gets over a mother or father or a loved one's death really but I came to terms with it years ago that was way back in 1958, it's 1966 now. He said, I'm gonna tell you something, I hope you never, ever, ever have to grieve the way I grieved back then. Mm. Man, let me tell you something. You know where I came from. I came from the deep south in poverty. Man, I, had, we didn't, I didn't have most things like most people. I grew up, you know, if I had new clothes, that was a major, major thing. You know where I was born. He said, we had nothing. And, and you remembered that moment then when you saw him on his deathbed. Exactly. And there was a flashback. It was a flashback. He said, and all of a sudden, we moved to Memphis. And it seemed like overnight, I became Elvis Presley. And my record started selling gold record after gold record. I'm on the Milton Berle show, Tommy Dorsey, Ed Sullivan. I'm making my first movie in Hollywood, my wildest dreams and fantasies. Everyone says I'm the biggest thing in show business. I go out to Hollywood and then all of a sudden, everything stopped. The curtain came down. I thought it was all over. I thought my career was finished. They draft me in the army. I thought that was it. And I didn't have to go in like most people. They offered me a position where I could go around the world to the bases and sing to the troops and the guys. And I didn't have to do what everyone else did. He said, but no, I wouldn't do that. I'm just like everyone else. And I wouldn't want to be seen that way. I want to be a role model. I'm just like every other guy. I respect America. I respect what we stand for. So I went in. He said, you know that picture of me where they're buzzing my hair in, when, I, when I was drafted? And I have that funny smile on my face. I was dying inside. They'd taken my hair off, Larry. So my career, everything, man. And you know what happens next a few weeks later? My mom died on me. My mom she was the light of my life. She was the only one I could really trust. The only one I could really go to, no matter what. So everything came crashing in on me, man. My career, my career. I bought Graceland for my mom and dad. I bought my, cat, my pink Cadillac for her and furs and jewelry. My mom died. My career, my mom, everything. Grieve, Larry, you have no idea. I hope you never, ever, ever have to grieve like I grieved. Then they ship me around the world. I don't know how I got through it, man. I would go to bed at night. I couldn't let anyone know what I was going through. Yeah. And he said, I would, I would say, God, why me? Why me? And you know me, Larry. I'm inquisitive. I want to know about everything. I want to know the reasons for everything. That's why we read these books. That's why we're searching for answers. And I can remember as a little kid. So was you understanding death? I would say to my mom, when I was like four years old, Mom, what about my twin brother, Jesse? Why? What, where is he? And she, honey, she would say to me, God has a plan for everyone. He had a plan for Jesse. He took Jesse back home to heaven. And someday daddy's going to go and someday I'm going to go. And someday in the future, way in the future, you're going to go. And someday, honey, we're going to all be together again. Back home in heaven. Someday. And Elvis looked at me and he said, that's what I believe, Larry. That's what I believe. That we're all going to go home someday. And that's what I thought about as I was doing, when I was watching Elvis lying in his coffin. And then I had to do his hair. 
Yeah. The and next... then just a, just a few few words uh, to, 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 to beautifully end this conversation. I that could to. that could be that could, that could just you know there's so much to yeah, say. But so how did you how for you you know what are what were the lessons in all this meeting and how did you dealt with what was coming next for you? Because I guess that was a new life starting too in some It's level. Total new life. The next day was his funeral at Graceland. And after the funeral, his father and son of the guys that worked for Elvis, we walked into the room where Elvis was lying in the casket because the lid was going to come down for the very last time. No one would ever see him again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you took all the great luminaries in show business history, I mean the great ones, the great, the great uh, heroes, Going back to John Wayne, Marilyn Monroe, James Dean, Brando, Sinatra, you put them all together. Do you know that more people go to visit Elvis each year than all the rest of them combined? Mm. So we're talking about someone who is so special that touched the heart and soul of humanity. Mm. And uh, So we were looking at Elvis, and the, the lid was going to come down. And as the lid was coming down, I made a conscious decision. I wanted to be the last person to ever touch Elvis. So I quickly put my hand in on his forehead like that, and I said something. And I pulled it out, and the lid came down. So I can say this to you. Elvis fulfilled. Elvis knew who he was. He came to love people and to tell people that we come from a, a source, call it God, call it Hashem, call it the, the great mind, call it the source, call it Allah, call it whatever you want. We come from the source of life itself. We prefer to call it God because everyone knows what that word means. We come from something that means something. Our lives mean something. There's a lot of people who think, oh, well, life's just a dream. Uh, a lot of people think life is all my, it's a dream, it's an illusion. Paramahansa Yogananda said to someone one day that said that to him, he said, well, if you think life is a dream, take your dream head and smash it against that dream wall. You know what you're going to get? Yeah. You're going to get a nice dream headache because it's real. Life is real. And we can make it even more so. We can enhance it. We could bring life to it. That's what Elvis did. He brought life to his career and to his fans and to the world through his music. He brought joy to people's lives. He gave more money than any celebrity that ever lived away. I saw him give kidneys hair transplants, homes, car, strange of it would come, he would give them some, he spread his wealth. He gave things away that I have found out that I didn't know about, he didn't want anyone to know. He would write checks for 10,000 and slip it to someone on the side. He did things, he was phenomenal. One afternoon, I'm doing his hair, right up here, up the road here in Bel Air, And his cousin came in and said, Elvis, the truck's here. We walked outside and Elvis said to all of us, got a surprise for you guys. And there was two trucks with 12 brand new big motorcycles, six blue, six red. He said, y'all just select the one you want. And outside the gates were dozens of Elvis fans. And there was a kid leaning against And Elvis motioned me to walk with him. We walked up to the kid, he was about 16 years old. And Elvis said, do you have a bike? The kid couldn't even look at Elvis, he was so nervous. He said, no. And Elvis said, you do now. Come on in and I have a bike for you. And the kid didn't move. Elvis put his arm around him, kind of like brought him in. The kid got a bike. If he was here right now, what would he say in this interview? If I would ask Elvis, what would be your last word here? Is there something If he you was want here to say? Right now, 
Elvis? Yes, I do know. Elvis, you told me time after time after time that you're going to stop touring, you're going to stop everything because your life is on the line. Why did you say you're going to wait till September? Why didn't you just do it then? Because if you would have done it then, you would be with us all now. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you, Lilo, for this opportunity. Thank you for taking the time to share this story. And uh, I know this is very, very meaningful and uh, you feel connected to that. So it takes a lot to do it. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very nice. Big, big kiss to all of you Juicy Core creators watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it and please spread it. Much love. Bye-bye.